there, how's it going? Welcome back to Screen Speak, because I'm presuming that you have come back. This isn't your first time here, is it? Is it really? We really? hope no. No, we do hope no, that's right. Uh, but welcome to Screen Speak. It is the podcast that's all about movies, life, and so much more. My name is Jordan Anderson. That's S O N at the end, not E N. Sorry, guys out there that had the E N last name. S O N. Jordan Anderson, this is my podcast, and I really appreciate you for coming by and giving this specific episode a listen, because I'm presuming that you like the movie Air, or you've seen it, or you just wanted to hear someone talk about it. In any case, you've come to the right place. Uh, If you haven't done one of these things already, go ahead and do so. I'll make this really quick. Hit the follow button, hit the bell on whatever it is you're listening to this on, so that way you don't miss out on future episodes. Social media, Instagram, Facebook, all that crap, it's all in the description of this episode and most any. So check that out if you want to get involved on there. That's it for the plugs. I think that's my fastest one yet. So awesome. (laughs) So I am joined once again by my beautiful wife that you can't actually see because I'm not recording this with video, but she's here so you can hear her beautiful voice. Hello, Isola. (laughs) I don't know about the beautiful voice, but... Hi, and also, he thinks I'm beautiful. I don't know about you guys. Maybe check out on his Instagram. You are on there sometimes in my Instagram. Exactly. I I hope I am. Well, and I think, uh, so the Cedar Rapids Independent Film Festival is coming up at the time of recording this. I'm not sure when exactly this episode's uploaded, but uh, my missus here is going to be a social media manager for me and or kind of marketing liaison. So you will or you have seen my face at his Instagram, ScreenSpeak Instagram. Follow us on Instagram and you will see my face there for a little bit during the festival. Yes, exactly. So I want to get right into this. I want to just talk about this movie, Air, uh, directed by Ben Affleck, starring him, Matt Damon. It's got a big ensemble cast. Uh, you got Marlon Wayans in there, Chris Tucker, Viola Davis. My wife's probably just like, I don't, I don't know these actors' names. I got to see faces. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you guys that don't know all the names, but it's still recognize their face but she's being a good sport because you get it because you know this movie is about sports a little bit that was a a little on the nose joke for you but anyways i just want to get my thoughts out of the way on this movie and just say i really actually think considering that this came out in april i think this already is one of the contenders for best movies of the year i i honestly think that right off the bat um what did you think about this movie I really like that. I agree with you. I hope they don't forget this movie by the end of the year when they are that is something talking about Oscars. I always wonder, like, yeah. if the movies <clears throat> that are released on the beginning of the year, if the movies that are released on the beginning of the year are, if they are, um, sorry, if they are, like, if people still remember about them at the end of the year, honestly, closer to the Oscar. So there's a lot of factors that actually go into that. A really good example of one very recently is the movie Everything Everywhere All at Once. Uh, Now, I know you only watched part of that movie, but you know it won Best Picture at last year's Oscars, right? Or this most recent one. That movie came out in February of of the year it came out. Yeah. I I, I mean, I might need to double check myself, but I definitely know it was like February, March time frame. I remember. (laughs) Well, it's not, it's not very common. Like that, I think, was a real anomaly because it's been for the longest time that I'll kind of go through this quick and, and then we'll keep going. For a very long time, usually for release dates, this is kind of how it went. January, you know, basically is a dumping ground for crap. That's how it was viewed for a long time where, you know, you get like your cheap, low budget horror movies, you get some things that don't really have much of a shot of a wide audience and they're just kind of there, right? Oh, she's going to sneeze. There <laughs> it is. Bless I'm you. Sorry. We going to get another one or is that just one? Bless no, you. No, just one. Thank God. That's okay. Um, so January is usually a dumping ground. February is statistically known for just your rom-coms, romantic movies because of Valentine's Day. Similar deal with like March and April. You might get some kind of light movies, comedies, that sort of thing. And then when you start pushing into around like June, July, August, you got your summer movie season blockbusters. This is how the cliches have been for a long time. Hmm. Then when you push to around September, sort of similar to a January, but not as bad. You kind of get your we don't really know quite how well it's going to do movie periods where it's like, eh, it could be good. Eh, It could be nothing. We don't really know. 
October, of course, you capitalize on the horror movies because of Halloween. So you're always going to get something then. And then Thanksgiving and the December time period. So November and December, that's when you usually get your award heavy categories or the things that are really like pristine. And of course, your holiday movies, Mm -hmm. sometimes in early January too, and limited release, it just depends on how they do it. But the model I just explained has been sort of the stereotypes on release dates for a long time. I bring up everything everywhere at once and and almost this movie because you're starting to see a lot more higher caliber quality movies coming out much earlier in the year than what's been traditional. And I think a lot of that's just because the, the release model is so much different now. Streaming has also affected release dates and when things can get out there to the public. Yeah. But a movie like this is cool because this is what I'd call like a mid-range, mid-budget movie. It's not like a big blockbuster, but it's not a small movie either because mm-hmm. of the cast and some of the stuff it's doing. But I really just think it checks a lot of the boxes on just what a good movie is. There's a lot to like about this movie, I think. Yeah, for my liking, it's really good. And you know me, I'm kind of picky. Well, what in particular did you like about this specific movie? The main thing that I like is because it's about real things. (laughs) You do like real things. I do. I (laughs) like reality-based movies, so I really like that on this movie. I feel that this movie is, just tonally speaking, I want to talk about this, it's very, it's a very light movie, honestly. Oh, so yes, you don't need to think too much. You basically just kind of watch it play out, like how things happened and how it ended. So it's really simple, I would say that, but not not in a bad way. <clears throat> so it's simple, but a good simple. It's I, like a, I feel like what you're trying to say is we that watched it's, that movie after a whole week of work in the evening, and I still was able to watch, pay attention, and understand just because it was not like heavy. Yeah, well, and, and the material of the movie, and just the, I'm going to keep sticking with the tone of it, it's very breezy. Like, I feel like, yeah. the, because, I mean, there is, like, some hardships, <laughs> and, like, there's some, you know, tension sometimes in scenes, but the overall story is very light, and it's inspiring, because mm-hmm. it's showing a group at the time of underdog people, which I still kind of laugh at the idea of underdog and Nike, because Nike is such a well-known uh, shoe brand now that it's almost hard to believe that at one point they would be considered underdogs right that was actually impressive for me because i know nike since it got famous i didn't know like before and i think sometimes we don't think that a big big company was at some point a small company yeah i mean big big things big (laughs) big things have small beginnings any anything does um but going back to the tone on this I think what I just find really fascinating about a movie like this, or just movies in general, is that your tone really does dictate a lot of just the overall vibe of a movie. Because if you really think about it, and I don't know if people think on this level a lot, this movie air, if you had given it to someone other than Ben Affleck, or you give it to somebody that just has a completely different artistic vision for the movie... You could still have the same script, have some of the same story beats play out, but it might not feel the same way. Mm-hmm. They could have made it be more serious and dramatic, maybe not as light. Um, yeah. There's a lot of different things they could do with it, but I'm really glad for this movie that they kept it light, inspiring, and what you would almost classically call a feel-good movie. I really feel like that's what this yeah. movie falls under. Yeah, because there's a lot of moments where like you're just smiling at at characters kind of getting successes uh, under their belts for business. They're furthering something. People are taking risks and the risks are paying off. Mm -hmm. Um, It's nice to be able to see stories like this sometime, especially again, when it's a true to life story. Yes. Um, Now, I want to talk on Nike because I know that we said that just a second ago where it's like they were an underdog at one point, Nike, like the billions upon billions of dollars that they make off of shoes and everything else. Uh, But at the time in this movie, in the mid 80s, they were number three, uh, where you have um, Adidas and Converse kind of ranking over them in the shoe game, uh, specifically with sports. Mm -hmm. Um, What did you think about just the overall shoe industry played out on here had you ever even thought about shoes that much before watching a movie like no this? it really opened my eyes and didn't i didn't think like about how they really 
kind of like fight against each other for the same public. Mm -hmm. So I didn't think about that. And I didn't think that the differences between the people that they are trying to sell shoes to. So in this movie in particular, they were focusing on like sports people, basically Mm -hmm. basketball people, right? Yeah. Yeah. So shoes for basketball, but like they even showed on the movie, they have different categories. So people that run, people that work out, people. So they have like even Mm -hmm. different departments on the company that will focus on those different people and like different marketings and different ideas, different budgets. Mm -hmm. So like the ones that give more money are the ones that they invest more in all of that. It was very interesting to to mm-hmm. just be able to see how those things work. I, I think what I I mean I completely agree with you about all the different business aspects that are on display in this movie. Where like you think about something as as ordinary to most people as a shoe, right? Mm-hmm. I don't think a lot of people, unless you're a real passionate person about shoes or there's the athletic connection through sports that you're really taking into consideration and appreciation all the work that goes behind what in your eyes might be considered a simple pair of shoes. Mm -hmm. I think that was one of the things I found very inspiring about this movie, particularly with the character that's the kind of quirky shoe engineer, Mm -hmm. um, which I did enjoy some of the comedy with that and how his personality is just kind of quirky and strange, but he's like a shoe genius. I, I thought that was really cool. Yeah. Um, But just showing – a movie like this just goes to show that regardless of what area you're passionate about, there is an avenue for you if you can kind of develop a skill set and an expertise with it. And I just really enjoyed how, you know, this guy that's making these shoes, he he's like an artist about it. You know, he really oh, like he takes is. every part of it seriously beyond just the engineering of how a foot is laid out in a shoe and everything. It was, it was really cool to see. Yeah, the design. I think he was a designer, no? Yeah, he was also the person that came up with the Air Jordan symbol that we're used to seeing where you have Michael yeah. kind of grabbing a ball through the sky kind with his fly. legs spread out. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Um, I, I just really, really appreciated that. It, it's like you, you think something like that is simple for some of it. And to a certain extent, some parts of it are. But every little crevice of a shoe is thought of. Like everything down to the lining of it to where like the soles are placed and everything. And I The re- colors even. I yeah. like the color part. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. I, I, I did not know specific to the game of basketball that the NBA, and I don't know if this has changed, but they had that it. regulation in place where at the time in the 80s, you couldn't have a certain amount of color in the shoe. I a think lot of it white. had to be 75% white or yeah. something like that. And it was very interesting that they were, so when they thought about the shoe for him, they wanted to do white and black and red because it's yep. the Bulls <clears throat> colors, right? Yeah, the Chicago Bulls, yeah. Yeah, so they wanted to do the team color, which, which makes sense, but they didn't want to do just a little bit of color, so they kind of want to go over the rule Mm -hmm. and do something different take the chances pay the fees for yeah there's fines like five grand a game yeah (laughs) so they was they were they decided to pay it because they thought it was worth it and i really think it was because it made like it wouldn't have everybody look to his shoe instead of looking to the like lame white shoes and also they even Use it that, which is also like, God, that's why those people have money, because they have such good ideas. They would even, like, take advantage of the fact that they would have to pay fees and that the NBA would go, uh, NBA, right? Yeah. They would go behind them because of the color, and they're like, <clears throat> oh, so NBA is going against Michael shoes because right. of the color. How ironic because he's a person of color. Mm-hmm. So it's just <clears throat> kind of like a dual thing that they, instead of that they use it in favor of themselves, like use it in favor of themselves to be like marketing instead of, you know. Yeah, I mean, they're able to look at something like that beyond just the the simple facts in front of them and kind of think big picture with it. Yeah. And then also very interestingly enough on that particular decision, how they're openly knowing that by doing this, they're going to be penalized, but that basically the rewards will offset uh, the penalties or the perceived penalties to them as an organization with the games. They and really I, had faith on <clears throat> him. And I did particularly enjoy that uh, Sonny Vaccaro, which is Matt Damon's character. Um, I think he's the first person I 
could be mistaken, but when the subject of the penalty comes up, he's just like, we'll pay the penalties. He oh, just yeah. like he just kind of makes the decision over the CEO's head, and then the CEO is just like, "What? Like we're, <laughs> like we're paying the penalties?" And they play that to comedy. Where like at that point, it's kind of too late. Like if he like acknowledges and tries to back out, he looks silly. So mm-hmm. he just kind of is stuck with <laughs> with having to do yeah. it. Um, but then Sunny did that on basically everything. He just kind of yeah. he just kind of took the chances and he put he put his his job and his uh, coworkers' job. Yes. In jeopardy because of like everything that he decided to take chance because he really believed in Michael Jordan. Mm-hmm. I definitely thought there was some real good representation of just taking risks, not only in business, but in life. And yeah. that apart from the rewards that can come from it, they really represented that fear of like what could go wrong and the mm-hmm. anxiety with that, particularly with Jason Bateman's character, which is yeah. the, the marketing director. Uh Um, they have this great monologue moment where he's talking about how he's divorced and he doesn't really get to see his kid that much. And one of the things that makes his kid happy is he, he brings them a pair of shoes and he talks about how, you know, he, he, he understands like where Sonny's head is at on this, but also doesn't know if he fully appreciates the risk because if it goes really South, people could lose jobs, including himself and then he even says, which I got emotional about when I'm watching it. He's like, even if I lost the job here and I, and I lost the stuff, he's like, I'd still just buy the shoes. You know, he's yeah. like, I'd still do it because I want my kid to be happy. And I was like, and that was kind of like a connection that they had that he had with his kid. Yeah. And I just I just really like that moment because some of it's a little on the nose as far as the risk, but there's a lot of it kind of in the subtext for it where they're showing the characters and you can kind of tell like Matt Damon is not necessarily saying much when the story is being said, mm-hmm. but you can tell that his character, like he's thinking about it, like seriously, he's he's realizing that there's all this weight behind these decisions. I think that was when he realized it. Yeah, I, before, I don't know if he, he did before He was then. just kind of like so excited mm-hmm. and so... And then on that point, I think, was when he started looking to his coworkers and like, wow, yeah. I have a big responsibility on my back. Like this, but then at the same time, it's like when you have no options, like he had no options, he had to make it work. So yeah. he <clears throat> did, you and, know. And I think sometimes in business too, I, I've certainly experienced this. There are moments where you have to make decisions and you don't have time to consult. You can't go back yeah. anymore. It's like, just no, it's, keep like, going it's, like it's like a now or never thing. And you truly got to trust your gut and back your decision that you make. Mm-hmm. So whether you succeed with it, you of course will, you know, take all the praise and the acclaim and, and you're happy it worked. But if it didn't, then at the same time, you got to own up to it. Yeah. Be like, yeah, I took a risk and it didn't work. Right. Yeah. Um, so I really liked how the movie was representing all those kind of different underlying aspects of the risks in business and the risk reward ratio mm-hmm. on there. I mm-hmm. really felt it smartly represented that. Yeah. And speaking of just this movie being intelligent and smart, the the screenwriter of this movie, uh, Alex, I, I can't think of his name. I'll, I'll the last name. It, it's a new screenwriter. I'll have to put his name in the description. I uh, was listening to a podcast also talking about this movie and found out this is his very first script. Really? Like, this is like he's a completely new mm-hmm. screenwriter, never done anything at least worth mentioning before, and that this is his first theatrical script. Wow. And I'm like, that's really impressive. And I'm also glad that they put the guy's name uh, in the marketing of the movie. I did notice that. Like when they were showing trailers, they'd show mm-hmm. like directed mm-hmm. by Ben Affleck, but then they did mention this guy. And I can tell you, I will definitely keep an eye out on this writer because I thought just tonally nails it with the dialogue and the script. There's good, smart written dialogue and the pacing of the movie is very good in large part to Ben Affleck, but in no short um, praise to this this writer. So I just thought I would mention that this is his first screenplay that he's written. That's a big deal. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> talking about Ben Affleck. Now, do you remember which one that is? <laughs> so he's the uh in the movie he's the ceo that kind of has the, cur- the curly hair yeah. okay i'm um, just making sure no i know now that you say the ceo i know yes. who was the ceo so he also directed- so people for you that are there don't know me basically everybody <laughs> i am so i can't memorize the actors or actresses name mm-hmm. but i know who they were on the movie 
So that's why Jordan has to be like the Nike CEO. I'm like, okay, that person, I know who he was. But I also don't remember his name on the movie. Oh, I try, ah, yeah. got you. <laughs> Finally. I'm, tr- oh, I'm trying to think if I, because Sonny Vaccaro is Matt Damon. And then, God, what is the CEO's name? Um, Oh, my God. It's going to drive me insane. And But I, I will not. I will not look it up. I will not look it up. <laughs> I can't think. I can't, I'm I'm sorry, Screen Speak. I can't think of it off the top. It's if it fine. comes back, he's I Nike will... CEO and he has curly hair. Yes, he's got kind of curly curly hair. And yes, he's a runner. Um, but I just want to talk about the just his direction and, and acting in front of the camera. Oh, because he's the director. He is the director of the movie. And you don't remember his name? No, no, no. I mean, I don't remember the character's name. Oh, yeah, I, re- true. I remember okay, Ben Affleck. Okay, of course. okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> no, so. So I just want to talk with you about this because I don't know how much you know thought you really kind of give to this particular thing, but I'm in very much fascination anytime someone can pull the hat trick, as I say, of directing something behind the camera and managing all of it while still delivering a performance in front of the screen. And he was good. He's very good. He's very, very good. I, I just didn't know. I mean, like, do you, do you think that you know more more people should do that or do you like do you think that it's interesting when people do that i didn't really give that a lot of thought but i believe it's really interesting and i don't know if more people can do that because i don't think it's it's a i don't think it comes just overnight that type of skill yeah exactly i don't think that i skill that is a skill that everybody can have so i think well, it I think with a, a lot from with a, him. Well, with a person like, but at the same time, sorry, yeah, no, you're fine. It might be really cool though, because like you are directing it and you are in it, so you are like on both sides and mm-hmm. you <clears throat> can control what yourself is going to do. So I think it can be even better because you are involved on both sides. I think it. I think a lot of it depends because Ben Affleck has had the privilege of working with really talented directors in his career. Um, I, I, I could probably name some of them off, but he's worked with David Fincher. He's worked with Michael Bay. I know, um, trying to think other directors that off the top that he's worked with, um, Gus Van Zandt. I mean, he's worked with a lot of really talented people. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes you find that actors, the ones that are fully immersed in the craft and the ones that kind of want to expand their, their skills, they're very observant, of course, to the performer in front of them because, I've heard constantly from listening to actors testimonials, how much of a better listener acting makes you because you have to be on point with your lines and you have to be fully present with the person to feel the emotion of the scene Mm -hmm. and to, you know, convey as much as you can. But I also noticed that a person like Ben Affleck, he has sort of been a student of film. You know, he's on these sets all the time. He's not a person that hides out in his trailer, you know, and waiting for him to get called over to the camera to shoot. He, he's talking to everybody, you know, he's just soaking it all up. And I think eventually he reached a point in his career where he got to direct Gone Baby Gone, which was his first movie mm-hmm. that kind of put that to the test. And I think that's a scary place for a lot of actors because, you know, that's like the first time you're sort of doing that that dance between the two. But then I also think the ones that pull it off beautifully, and I think Affleck is on the short list of this. He has the actor experience that he knows how to talk to actors he knows what actors look for in a director and how to communicate with them. Yeah, and sure. that's a huge benefit that sometimes even some of the best directors don't. They yeah, aren't, because they aren't he is on both director. sides. So, so he knows. Yeah, and I do believe it makes a big difference. A huge difference. And, and I really think, I mean, if I'm looking at his filmography, so I, I can list off the ones I know about. There's, there's Gone Baby Gone. There's The Town, which was follow up. There's uh, Live by Night that came, I think, after Argo. Argo mm-hmm. came before. So you got those four movies. And then I think this might be his fifth. Uh, there might be another one that I'm missing in there. He hasn't done a ton. But I can honestly tell you that this is in like my top three directed Ben Affleck movies. The Town is still my favorite uh, Ben Affleck directed movie. Um, but I would definitely put like... Argo and Air. I, I put both these movies actually pretty close side by side because they're both true story movies that are interesting, tonally very different because Argo's a, a big time thriller and this one's more of a feel good up and comer uh, underdog story. But I just really got to commend uh, Ben Affleck on this because I think he's come a long way as an artist. He's 
directionally just getting even better and better each time he's putting out a movie. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I really think that he, he, he killed this one. I mean, he knocked it out of the park. This is a movie that a lot of people could watch and of all different types of backgrounds, even if you're not a basketball person, you could easily watch this and take away something from it. That's entertaining. Yeah, sure. Um, Talking about the cast on this, I mean, I'll, I'll put some of the faces to the name for you so so that we're making it make Thank sense. Thank you, Jordan. <laughs> um, but again, I love a good ensemble cast where there's no egos and everybody is sort of an established person that you've seen before, but they're all kind of taking a backseat to the bigger picture of the story. Um, Matt Damon and Ben Affleck alone, I love seeing them together. Um Honestly, Mo, I need to I need to show you Goodwill Hunting, which is the first movie that they ever worked on together. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a true story, but it's very realistic. Mm -hmm. um, and the, it, it's just I could I could rewatch that movie so many times, and I have. It's it's a beautiful film. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> just seeing the chemistry that they have together, seeing how long they've been friends, I think if you've been following their careers, you'll appreciate that element a lot more as opposed to maybe you're not aware of the friendship or not. But then you also have a great supporting cast like Chris Tucker. I can't think of the guy that plays Michael Jordan's agent, but I got to give a shout out to that actor because I thought he was really funny as kind of being the pissed off, short tempered agent that's just mm -hmm. trying to control stuff. But people keep just doing Finding stuff around him and he's just like, what the hell are you doing? I'm going to chop your yeah. balls off. And, <laughs> and he was funny. Um, I really, really enjoy that actor and I, I hope to see him in more things. But so he's not really <clears throat> that famous then? Um, he, I mean, I don't want to say that. I mean, at least to me, I haven't seen him. Um, but for Which all I know, the, yeah, but for all I know, the guy could be like in other movies I haven't seen or TV shows. Yeah, true. I never try to be one of those people, honestly, where it's like, oh, you haven't seen something or you haven't heard of this guy. <gasps> oh my God. Because there's so much content out there now. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. I mean, and you know, and, and whatever floats your boat, that's, I'm a big believer of that. Um, I want to talk about shoes, as if you can imagine, because we're talking about <laughs> why we're talking, talking about a movie about shoes. But I, I just I got to throw some of these questions out there, and I don't even know if I'm going to come up with an answer. But I just want to ask them because I'm sure I'm not the only person that thought about it while watching this movie. A, I kind of just wish I understood more, even beyond this movie, just what's with the the world of shoes like you know there, there's obviously a big demand for it apart from just people wearing it but i know there's like whole shoe communities of like fans that collect different types of shoes oh, yeah. there's shoe conventions i i definitely tell you there's sneaker con that's one of the big ones um and there's just like people that manufacture shoes people that start getting a love of shoes and make a career out of it doesn't that fascinate you yeah like why how, how does somebody get involved with shoes? Is it purely from the sports angle? I think it's from whatever community they they can create around the shoe. It can be the sports. It can be the style. It can be... So I think it's just a way for people to connect. And I also wonder specific to athletics, where... Like the connection came because I'm, you know, I know Michael Jordan's definitely not the first athlete that kind of basically had a shoe created off his image, but other athletes must have come before. And eventually there must have been the parallel where it's like, as a shoe company, we can make a line around a person, you know, they're like, we can make a brand on a person and tie it to a product. Mm -hmm. I found that very interesting for air and just trying to kind of understand like, where did that come from? Like, why, why, why is the shoe suddenly going to be the thing where it's like, if this person wears it, everybody's going to buy it? Is it just because they're in front of a mass audience and everybody sees what they're wearing and it's like, you just want to yeah, have it? And I think not only shoes, whatever those people wear, like their fans, we want to wear too. Yeah. It kind of approximates <clears throat> them. It's like, if he is wearing that shoe or that clothes and I can wear the same <clears throat> Here, I feel like I'm closer to them. Funny you say that because you're tying it in perfectly to the the monologue that's eventually delivered by Matt Damon, where he mm -hmm. kind of like cuts all the bullshit and he's like, I want to tell you why you're right for Nike. Mm -hmm. And he says something very similar to you. If I had the audio, I'd probably throw it in. Maybe I will. 
But he basically said that is like, this is a way for people to get a taste of your greatness. Yeah. Like it makes them feel connected to you. It, it's a way to, to put out that we support what you're doing just because we're wearing an article of clothing or an apparel or a shoe that reminds people of you. I think there, there's a power in that. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and I just, I found that really compelling to think about because I'd never really thought about um branding from that type of an aspect and and this is coming from me who you know i i went to school for graphic design i've certainly had my share of you know run-ins with things and marketing and whatnot and i have a pretty good sense of these things but i think just seeing it purely on display in this movie and just showing how many people can connect with something physical like that and even if it's just a piece of clothing it's like that can mean so much to people yeah um i really just i I, it's fascinating i I would love to talk with somebody that either you know works for a big place like that and just kind of pick their brain about the process and how they sort of figure out how to market to people it's it's fascinating again i don't really have anything i'm offering here other than just saying wow that's cool um (laughs) but it's cool it's it's really really cool so i just want to put that out there um now what did you think of the 1980s in this movie the time period you mean? yeah just the time period you know you got the music you, you got you know there's no cell phones things like that oh, i mean true. Do, do you think about that when you're watching a movie like this so you're just like eh, like it's the 80s I kind of thought when he had to drive all the way there to talk to <laughs> the mother yeah, he couldn't schedule a teams or a zoom with a them. zoom meeting yeah yeah i kind of did I kind of like that, though. Um, not saying that, like, oh, it's cool they have to do things that way and drive all that distance, but isn't there a spontaneity and a freedom with that? It's mm-hmm. like, the hell with it. I'm getting in my car and I'm going. Yeah. I'm going to go figure this out. It's yeah. bold. I mean, you could, I guess, try to just video call someone without telling them, but how how exciting is that? Not the same. <laughs> it's not at all yeah, the same. Yeah, they can just ignore you. No, <laughs> If you're but- at their door, it's harder to ignore. I think I I enjoyed uh, overall the 80s representation. Some people will, you know, anytime you have a movie that takes place in a different decade, there are some people that are, so to speak, students of that time. You know, they grew up with it or they really like certain parts of the technology. And so they'll watch a movie like this and be like, did they get the cars right? The computers look right? You know, does the paint Mm -hmm, look right? mm -hmm. The clothes? I really do like all that stuff. I do appreciate that just tonally this movie uh, was able to take a lot of popular 80s songs and kind of throw them in at the right mm-hmm. moments. And it just helped kind of keep the light fluffiness of the movie uh, going, dribbling across the court. See what I did there? Basketball. That's uh, pretty. I, I got to stop just calling these jokes out, right? Just being like, they'll, they'll figure it out. Figure yeah. out that I make a joke. If, like, if the joke is a, a good joke, they will. But the thing is, is it's interesting podcasting because, you know, I if I say something funny, I don't necessarily always know if it's funny. I can't see them. Exactly. They can Maybe. tell. You don't need to explain. If you need to explain. That's true. It sucks if I have to explain. Exactly. Kaboom. See? Bad. Bad <laughs> joke. Um, but no, the 80s, uh, I liked it. It's cool. Um, I don't always necessarily like every movie that's like set in the 80s because some can be overly nostalgic or they just focus yeah. too much on the aspects of the 80s but this the 80s thing never got in the way of it i, I never was like oh i'm constantly being beat over the head that this is 1980 no. or 1984 i think is when it took place um well we got to talk about somebody who, who do you think we got to talk about in this movie huh there's a specific person that we haven't really oh, mentioned of course the who, main that? character in my opinion which is uh, michael jordan's mom <laughs> well michael jordan and michael jordan's mom that's why i was kinda... <clears throat> no but she's a <laughs> yeah but the but the movie is still centered around michael so you can't talk about this movie without yeah, talking about michael jordan okay yeah, and his mom we will get to his mom but oh, okay. focusing on just the guy himself um okay. Now I know you and I are actually right now. I'm, I'm showing her the the Last Dance, the Netflix documentary, yeah. which I've seen before. And if you, I, I mean, if you like documentaries and just like you know miniseries like that, if you haven't seen that one, even if you don't give a shit about basketball, check that one out. It is damn good. But I'm curious, Isola. What? Before we watched Air, before we started watching Last Dance, what did you know about Michael Jordan? Not much. I but just you've heard knew, of him. Yeah, right? I have heard. I just knew that he was one of the best. 
or maybe the best mm-hmm. basketball player here in America. Have you ever taken interest in athletes before, just like their no, stories or much of anything like that? Not really. Okay. I would just figure maybe being from Brazil, you like, you know, like Pele. We always talk about Pele. I know <clears throat> what I hear about them. I don't know mm-hmm. anything else because I never go out of my way to research about them or mm-hmm. anything like that. Did it surprise you at all? Just not just like the pressure they put on the athletes to sort of like choose a deal to kind of go with for like their career. But did it surprise you like how much money they're willing to shell out for something like that? Oh, yeah. And how good he was to surprise me because for them to be like crazy uh, going for him, it's because he was really good. I do find that very interesting because there's definitely no guarantees in life, let alone sports, especially um, athletic competition sports, Mm because you have to think about it. So many things. I mean, the guy could break his leg and just be out, you know, just boom, done. Um, So there's definitely tremendous risk on that. But what I thought was cool for the story and Michael is that a the story centered around him, but they never actually show him, which I thought was smart. I did think it was smart because it's about the business and the dealings and everything. And he's sort of the focal point, but he doesn't need to be shown. And and Ben Affleck's even been on record. He says he's so iconic. It doesn't really make sense to try to cast some really good actor to a character that's not going to get much screen time, you know? Yeah. Um, But that said, I have to just think about Michael's perspective and think – you know, this guy at the time, I think he was like maybe like 18, 19, 20. You know, mm-hmm. this is like very early in his career before he's even like mega huge superstar with the Bulls or anything like that. But I just think he is represented so well. I mean, not only by his family, but just the fact that his, I guess I'm tying it to his family, that his family helps him shop around deals, not just take the first thing that comes. That can, yeah. Um, I felt like they were very strategic and, mm-hmm. and smart about it and mm-hmm. that... It was just kind of cool because I could, I don't know why, I could easily see um, some, you know, some kind of modern basketball player now just being like, give me that money and like being me, me, me and like making a big show and like kind of puffing their chest like I'm the best, you know. But I felt like Michael in the movie, at least he's portrayed that he's very much just I'm going to hear out the best pitch Mm -hmm. and kind of do what's best for my image. And my family ultimately and my mom is going to. Make be the, the person decision. that guides and makes the decision. So we got to talk about, uh, I believe it's Dolores Jordan, um, Michael Jordan's mother, played by the freaking amazing Viola Davis. I do think she's a scene stealer in the movie. Mm-hmm. Anytime she's there, I'm like, she's she's amazing. She's great. What did you think about his mom? Oh, my gosh. In my opinion, the movie, <laughs> the main actor, I mean, the main character is her mom. Why would you say the main character is his mom? To you, anyway. To me, because in the whole history, like in everything that happened, I think she plays a really big whole role on his life mm-hmm. and on the decision, on the final decision. And you know, like, basically, <clears throat> they were trying to convince her to choose Nike. Right. Because they didn't even, they couldn't even be talk to Mike a lot. Yeah. Well, the, and they obviously knew early on that the she mom the is kind of like, yeah, like she's the boss. And right? it's kind of cool that they show that. It's it's interesting. And like, and how smart she was, you know, being, so she was really, like, she trusted her feelings on her, that her son was really good. Mm-hmm. And she was really smart on the the, the financial decisions that she made, yeah. which <clears throat> is amazing because they didn't have a, a lot of money. So you believe mm-hmm. like she didn't have a lot of education, at least I believe. And she was still very smart on her decisions. So Yeah. And I, I think what was very interesting to see and it was inspiring to me and it makes me just kind of realize probably how exceptionally rare a family dynamic like that is yeah i can't tell you how many times uh mainly through like child actors i'll kind of put this analogy with that you always hear so many times of like a kid that becomes really famous and like their mom or their dad just uh, beca- becomes their manager mm-hmm. and then of course you know they put them in the horrible deals they steal half their money their garbage to them and you know are just very self-serving but in michael's mom's case i mean 
she's wanting purely, at least in this movie, to make the best decision for her son and his legacy. She's very exactly. aware of the legacy. So she was not only thinking on her and him and mm -hmm. his family, but she was thinking like... She was what thinking could, big picture. Yeah, exactly. What could, who could we help? What could we do with that money? And like, mm -hmm. and even for the other athletes, like they open a door that they can make those <clears throat> big negotiations too, which is really fair. Because yeah. usually all that money would be just for the company. And that was something I had no idea about that even in that time, it was virtually unheard of that a person like a shoe product where a brand is built around somebody that sure they'd give them a big fat check and some money up front to, start, yeah. to you know to start and kind of and kind of get them on board but that they wouldn't receive essentially a royalty for products being sold from that point on, on. and i was like really like that's so that wasn't a thing and that's what amazes me that she had that mind and the courage to just be like I believe that's how it should be done. And that's what I want you to do. And then he was like, we never did it. it, it that's not how it works. And then mm -hmm. she's like, oh, but now maybe it's going that's to work going now. to be like that. <laughs> I thought that was extremely bold and, and telling of just her integrity and how, you know, she didn't even let like, she wasn't even like when, when he was kind of going against it, she didn't like try to argue, you know, she didn't try to be like, now, wait a minute here and like start doing any of that. Mm hmm. She just held her ground. She just held her ground. And she's like... That's why I, I say, like, she just believed on what she was doing. She knew that it made sense because it did. Mm -hmm. And uh, and she also knew her son. It was awesome. I think that's a tremendous thing. And God knows how much of her strength and will got put into Michael mm -hmm. at an early age. Mm -hmm. And I just... I don't know. I, I, could, I could get emotional talking about this because, you know, I, everyone for myself, like... My mom, I, I love her to death. You know, she's a great mom, but I never got really a great degree of confidence, if much of any, instilled from her. And, and I've talked with her about this. So I'm not like airing dirty laundry out on the podcast. It's not like that. Mm -hmm. um, but a, a, a mother's a mother's love makes a tremendous difference in a person's life, if you're even assumingly lucky enough to have one. And I just think back to my mom, you know, like she she did her best, like for sure. And she did a lot of things right. I mean, a hell of a lot of things right. But mm -hmm. I I can't help but sometimes think in the back of my head that the what ifs of if I had developed confidence earlier in life or if I had, you know, everybody thinks about the things or, you know, personality Dates. traits we could do yeah. differently. Yeah. But I just, I think Michael and, and the mother, the whole story, like they're so fortunate that they had their heads held high and that they – thought of themselves highly enough, but never to it feeling like arrogance. And they believe you know? in each other, you know, because she believed in him, but he believed in her too. Because mm -hmm. uh, up to the end of his career, according to the movie, mm -hmm. and he was like, she was um, taking care of a lot of the money that he made, a lot of the, mm -hmm. how do you say, the volunteer things they, yeah she was like the head of like two volunteer boards i want to say yeah, or something like that yeah so like he sh he it was not like oh now that i am over age i can over 21 i can just like take care of everything and you are out of my thing and she is still like with him and mm -hmm. like so it shows that their relationship is really good no i i think their relationship and i certainly agree that I mean, you could still, I guess, do this movie and not centralize it as much around Michael Jordan's mom, but I do think it's integral to the movie that they focused it as the way they did on her. Mm -hmm. um, it was really, really inspiring. Um, and, and again, I, I just got to go back to like the the mother's love and everything like that. It's it's everything I think for a young person. I mean, like confidence does not always come from a purely natural place like we're yeah. a product of our environment i think yeah. at the end of the day and i just I, I especially imagine for athletics and and people that are sports oriented which i am not uh, i wish i guess part of me wishes i could be but I, i'm happy not being a pro ball player <laughs> <laughs> i'm fine um 
but God bless uh, anybody that's able to have that kind of strength given to them from their family yeah. and people that can't have that luck in their life. Like they don't have uh, a rock of a mother like that. I I really sincerely hope they can find it from other people because I don't think it's impossible to get or if you don't have your mom. Too. Yeah, yeah, or from themselves. From life, you know, you start seeing that like if you go there, you just make things happen. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of that comes down to just purely. It's gonna sound heavy. It's gonna sound heavy. Some of it's just your soul. It's just who you are, how you handle tough times in your life. There's a mm -hmm. lot of things that, of course, feed that, but I really always think there's a part of a person that can't be, it's not influenced from anywhere and it's not taught from anywhere. Sometimes there's qualities in a person that that yeah. is just who you are. I believe right? in that, Joe. And yeah, I mean, like it says an awful lot about yourself, how you not only look at attitudes, but just what you, or not, excuse me, not how you uh, just perceive a situation through an attitude. She's pouring some water here, folks. Um, Are you thirsty? Drink water. I, I'm not thirsty. I still got some kombucha. I'm offering water for them. Like, if you Are didn't you drink enough water microphone? today, just go and get a glass of water. It's really good. Here, here. Yeah, drink it. It's, ooh, can we hear it? Mm. So refreshing. Is it, is it too cold? No. It's the listeners, perfect. you know, they can't see you do it. So I need you to describe every bit of it. <laughs> <laughs> It's a glass made of glass. Uh-huh. <laughs> With water made of water. Mm, very, very astute observation there. <laughs> and uh, sorry. Pretty cool. Yes. Not it, hot, not cold. No. Perfect temperature. Uh, I got one more thing I want to talk about, and then I want to. I'll start start to wind this down with you because I know we, we've worked all day. I appreciate you being a good sport. Of um, course. Probably should owe you a foot rub or something like that. I like that. Yeah, see, I'm on the record now. I got to do it. So. Sure, yeah. Um, but I want to talk about sort of the dreamers aspect in this movie that I found where hmm. there's just something really to be said about, you know, having a vision, right? Mm -hmm. I go back to the CEO who I think Ben Affleck's first name is Phil. Might be Phil Knight. I think it's Phil. I Ooh. could be. No, say, no, no, don't, don't look. <laughs> I, I'll find look. out after if I'm full of it or not. But aye, aye, aye. I really was inspired by the CEO and his vision and how throughout the movie they kind of pepper these different quotes from Nikes or mantras that sort mm. of uh, reflect mm -hmm. what's going on in the scene in the movie or the upcoming scenes. And I really liked that his CEO was, I mean, he was eccentric, but he also was like, He's very level headed. He had like this thing with Zen where he's like very <laughs> calm and he, you know, keeps things very mm -hmm. even keeled. But then he drives a flashy Porsche. He, he wears this kind of flashy clothing to kind of be seen. He has some of the ego that goes with being in a high position like that. Yeah. Um, but I really just enjoyed that you could clearly tell. Certainly at one point when he's first starting Nike that he's like, I have a vision for a company. I don't fully know how I'm going to get it all figured out, but. I have a direction I want to go on and I'm going to do it win or lose. And that just got me thinking for people that are in business and people that take these tremendous risks, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's on an individual, a product, a big sum of money, people's livelihoods, the list goes on. But here's my question for you. Okay. Oh, yeah. It's a question. Yeah. In your opinion, because I, you know, this is, this is very subjective. Can't be anybody else's opinion. So. No. So hang on, you're listening, right? Yeah. Sorry, you said you were looking like behind you or something. Here's what I want to know. How much of success, however you define it, right? Let's stick with business though, business success, right? Mm -hmm. How much of that do you think boils down to strictly like the subject matter expert style? So meaning like the stuff that you know specific to the job, right? Like the job specific skills, right? Versus the other side, which is risk, ambition, your personality, your tenaciousness, your belief in yourself. How much do you think the two go hand in hand? Or do you think there is one that offsets the other? Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, it does. I think it goes pretty close, but I think taking risks is a, that that side of it. It's a little bit higher. I would be forty percent knowledge. 
30, 40, and then 60, 70. Because you can be the best and you can know all, all of it. But if you don't do anything with it, it won't take you anywhere. Are you saying just like Nike to just do it? Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. Do it. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a reason that slogan is brilliant. It's awesome. Oh, God. Yeah. <clears throat> it's just it because it's basically that, you know, if you think too much. Yeah. I have heard like uh, saying in some podcasts that I listen that they say like about business and stuff if mm -hmm. you if you uh start doing something let's say you wanna have a podcast and if you want to start a podcast and if when you start the podcast your podcast is perfect mm -hmm. it means that you started too late now why now why would that be can you explain that more so anything that you do, if you just do when it's perfect, it's mm -hmm. because it's already too late. Because you took too long right. planning and thinking and doing all of that and instead of just like doing it. And mm -hmm. doesn't matter how good you are, when you start doing it, it will not be perfect like it will you still have a lot that you will learn that you will only learn when you mm -hmm. do so as fast as you can act yeah as fast as you can start doing whatever it is it will you will just improve faster so that's why i say the action uh is more important than mm -hmm. the knowledge because the theoretical knowledge hmm, mm -hmm. mm, doesn't take you that far yeah and, and i i would my answer is actually be very, very similar, uh, mm -hmm. because I, I, I can only relate to my own immediate experience. And, and I can tell you that probably like some of the most gratifying moments I've had in my own life, whether it is personal or professional, some of it, you know, even maybe a lot of it, sometimes you could boil came down to a skill set that I learned and I learned how to do it well, a mm -hmm. technical skill or a hard skill, as they would say. Mm hmm. But I think the soft skill side, whether it's knowing how to talk with people, knowing how to take care of myself and take care of my mind, knowing how to deal with tough situations and knowing when not to overthink something and try to act on the spot and trust my gut. Now, some of these things are things I will always be working on, as we all will. I don't mm -hmm. think you ever fully have it figured no, out. Neither. But I would definitely say that, you know, I, I, I've met some very smart people in my life and I hope to continue to, but the ones I admire and certainly respect the most are not just smart, fascinating people in their brains, but in their actions. Exactly. And I really don't think that you can be successful in whatever field it is you're doing without that other side of it, the side that is not a book side. Exactly. I really think that. I agree. And, and, I, and I tell people this all the time, and then I'll wrap this up. Um, I can't understate how important or overstate, I should say, the importance of proactive behavior. Proactive, meaning I'm not waiting for someone to tell me to do this. I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. I'm making the direction for myself. So what if nobody's done this before? I'm going to do it. Oh, has is this the right way to do this? I don't know, but I'm going to find out. What's the mm -hmm. worst that's going to happen? I'm going to get told no or I fail. Okay. Or you do wrong and then you And then I learn. It. Yeah, and then exactly. I learn and I do it again and again and again until it is right for me. You know? I mean, like when you look at it, when you look at certain things like that in business and life, things kind of get more simple. Yeah. Right? Um, I have to say these things sometimes out loud because I need reminders of it sometimes. Yeah. Like a lot of people do. Yeah. So this is a great point and i'll and i'll end the podcast on this this movie absolutely spoke to me on all the levels that i just said i mean this an, an episode like this and the points i'm making on here are honestly sort of like the epitome of screen speak as a podcast mm -hmm. is a movie about a shoe <laughs> right a yeah. movie about a shoe yep air the air jordan line makes you realize and draw connections so to these different yeah, things yeah 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 um and that's why this movie, it's its one of the my favorite movies so far of 2023. Um, 
I definitely think it's a great one to have a conversation around and Mm -hmm. makes you just think about certain things that you don't always have the time to think about. Unless, of course, you work in shoes and then this this is your day to day. And I'm (laughs) sure the shoe industry has changed drastically since this time period. Yeah. Love to talk with someone in shoes to figure that out. But any final thoughts that you want to say on this? I want to just say something. Yeah. Just do it. That's it? That's it. All right. Well, keep it nice, short, and sweet, just like my beautiful wife. Thank you for joining me. I'm not short. <laughs> yeah, I know. I just realized that you're not actually really short. You're, you're taller than than like the average lady. I, I guess. Would say. I don't know. I'm f- five eight, I think. But I love any time you come on the podcast. I do. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Screen speakers. Give me a follow, give me a like. I mean, not me, the podcast. Because I was going to say, how, I can, I'll put your social in Because that's how I will know <laughs> that you guys like me, so I can come back. Means the world. I'm always here, so. It means the world to me, having your support. Of course, always and forever. We're, we're going to hold hands right now. There yes, we go. we're mm. together. Okay, high five. You can hear that. <laughs> all right, everybody. We'll take, uh, I was about to say, we'll take care, but we will take care. And then you will also take care, uh, hopefully, I'm telling you to take care, I'm forcing yes. you to. You all do take care. Please and do it. I will hear you all. Oh, good Lord. The, 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 the conclusion of this is falling apart. I'll see you all in the next episode. Take care. See you. See you, guys. Bye bye.